I hope uh, all of you have an outline, and if you don't have an outline, uh, please raise your hand, and uh, I'm sure copies can be supplied. Uh, keep those hands raised uh, so that David can see them. A couple of hands here, David. So when I was in school, I uh, never enjoyed uh, history and geography, and partly because those who taught that lesson never made it interesting. Uh, I'm sure you could identify with me, and uh, most of the time I literally memorized stuff. I never really understood the subjects. I just memorized for the sake of exams. But today, I really appreciate history and geography. In fact, if I had the time, I would follow some courses in history and geography. So today you're going to uh, get a history-geography lesson combined. And uh, when I say 400, the number 400, I think the first thing that would jump to your mind and my mind is the, uh, the 400 series of highways, 401, 404, 403, 427, 409, uh, and of course, Highway 400. Now, in the Bible, <clears throat> 400 uh, figures quite prominently. So, the first statement in your notes, 400 years of enslavement in Egypt. <clears throat> the, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, the Hebrews, uh, were slaves in Egypt for 400 years under Pharaoh. And it's very interesting in Genesis 15, it was actually prophesied that they would be slaves for 400 years. And then in Acts 7, uh, we have this uh, sermon by Stephen where he uh, reiterates the fact that uh, in the Jewish history, there was a 400 year period of enslavement. And then of course, God raised up Moses and Moses became the deliverer and uh, the champion. And uh, so that's a very significant time period, 400. Something else that I discovered, if you read through the book of Judges in your Bible, that's one of the books where the pages are all stuck together. We hardly refer to it. Uh, you'll find that the book of Judges covers a time period of about 400 years, 400 plus years. So again, a very significant time period in Jewish history. So now I'm going to read the first para. The Old Testament canon closes with the prophecy of Malachi at about 397 BC. So the period between Malachi and the first book of the New Testament, Matthew, that time period is 400 years, and generally it's called a dark period. Why? Because there was no prophetic voice. And uh, in the book of Psalms, very interestingly, uh, that has been mentioned. So I've quoted the verse for you. Psalm 74, 9. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet. And there is none among us who knows how long this time period is going to last. So in the Psalms, it was predicted that there was going to be this 400-year uh, time period where there was going to be no prophet. Now, it's also absolutely intriguing if you read Daniel's prophecies. Normally, we associate Daniel's prophecies with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ next year at our Deeper Life Retreat. We are going to be studying the book of Daniel. And uh, Daniel also makes very interesting prophecies about this 400-year time period. Absolutely fascinating. And we know that it had to come from God. Thus authenticating not only the prophecy of Daniel, but the entire Bible. Now, the best way to look at this 400-year time period is to divide it into three main sections. So, point A in your notes, we are going to look at four key rulers. There, are, there were many rulers in this 400-year time period, but we are going to focus on four of them. Number one is Persia. 
and Persia ruled over Judea till 331 BC. And if there is one thing you need to remember about Persia is that they contributed a significant foreign policy. And we are going to find out what that foreign policy is in a moment. So King Solomon's uh, time period is generally referred to as the golden era of Jewish history. No wars, peace, the borders extended for as far as they could be extended. And uh, after Solomon, unfortunately, uh, the nation split into two. Ten tribes became known as the Northern Kingdom Israel, and two tribes became known as the Southern uh, Kingdom, known as Judea. Now, because of the idolatry and unfaithfulness to God, both these nations, the Northern and the Southern uh, part of the kingdoms, were taken into captivity. So who took them into captivity? The Babylonians. The Babylonians came and they conquered Israel and Judah and they were taken into captivity. Now if you want to read something about that captivity, you need to read Jeremiah. You need to read the book of Lamentations where you are given explicit details about how this captivity uh, took place. Now, Babylonia was uh, overrun by Persia. Persia came and conquered Babylon. So what did Persia do? There was a very intriguing leader by the name of Cyrus, and Cyrus had an interesting foreign policy. He wanted the Jewish people to go back to their home. So all the way from Babylon, they are given permission to go back to the land of Palestine, to go back to Israel. Now, the going back occurred in what I would like to call three waves. They didn't all go together at the same time. The first wave <clears throat> is under the leadership of a man by the name of Zerubbabel. And uh, Joshua was the high priest uh, during that time period, Zerubbabel, 50,000 Jewish people returned to the land of Palestine. Now, it took them 20 years after their return to uh, build the temple, <clears throat> to rebuild the temple. So 20 years, they kind of did their own thing, and God had to send some prophets to stir up the people Guys, you have forgotten the temple, the place of worship, and the people woke up, and uh, they, uh, uh, after, with many hardships and much opposition, they built the temple. Then 58 years passed, and a scribe, scribe is actually a lawyer, we'll talk about a little later, <clears throat> by the name of Ezra, returns to Jerusalem with a small group of people, and that's called the second wave. And what did Ezra do? So the temple is now standing. The temple is functional. Ezra came and taught the people the law. One of the greatest revivals that you would read in biblical history has got to be Ezra chapter 9. A great chapter for you to read to, uh, this afternoon after your meal. And in Ezra 9, you will find that the people stood up for hours as Ezra had the scriptures read and explained. So Ezra was very concerned about the spiritual life of the people. It's one thing to have a temple standing, a building standing, and people can just come and do their religious thing. But uh, Ezra had enough uh, perception to realize uh, that the heart had to be right with God. So he begins to teach the law, the Old Testament scriptures. Now, that's the second wave. The third wave occurred 13 years later under Nehemiah. Okay, and that's the man that most of us are very familiar with. In fact, the book of Nehemiah in the Bible is used even in the secular world for leadership principles. Very, very interesting. How the world recognizes Nehemiah to be an amazing leader 
and they look at that book for leadership principles. So Nehemiah comes and what was his main project? The rebuilding of the broken down walls of Jerusalem. Now, why you make a big fuss about walls, guys? Walls equals protection. Like today you have your ships, warships, and your warplanes, and you have all your bombs. And uh, in those days, they didn't have any of that stuff. <laughs> it all depended on how secure your walls were. And if the walls are breached, you're finished. You're gone as a nation. The enemy invades. So Nehemiah was responsible for rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. By the way, talking of Nehemiah's leadership style, when uh, Nehemiah saw people not uh, living up to uh, uh, the biblical standard, uh, he had the audacity to pull the hair of people and to pull the beards of people. I've been tempted to do that at times, but in Canada, if you do that, you will end up in prison. And Brother Arup will have to come with his guitar and sing to me, right? But uh, Nehemiah did it, <laughs> and he got away with it. You're like happy or sad? Right, I don't know. You're like giving me a uh, look. Now, how do you take uh, these three waves, and how do you summarize it? So now start filling in your blanks. Restoration of the people to their land. 70 years of captivity in Babylon. Now under Cyrus, the Persian leader, they are given permission to go back home. So restoration of the people to their land. It's almost like the people shouting and saying, we are going home. We are going home. The second bullet is the rebuilding of the temple. <clears throat> so why is the temple important? Because it was the visible reminder of the presence of God among his people. A visible, tangible reminder that God is present with us. Much like a church building today, right? A, a gentle reminder that God is here, that God is present with us. And uh, Persia was kind of pretty generous in that they allowed the people to do their own ruling. <clears throat> So they didn't have heavy impositions uh, imposed on the people. You do your own ruling. The third bullet is, of course, the revival under Ezra. And, and Ezra brought the people back to the Bible. I love that uh, uh, organization. I love that radio program. Back to the Bible. And that's what Ezra succeeded in doing. And I hope that's what I am doing every Sunday, trying to get you back to the Bible. Not to books, but back to the Bible, to read the word of God for yourself and to apply it to your personal life. And the fourth word is the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Okay, so that's what happened under uh, the Persian rule. Cyrus is the main name. Now the second ruler that we are going to look at is of course Greece. So there came a moment when Persia was conquered by the Greeks. And of course the name that looms large uh, in our thinking is Alexander the Great. And Alexander was an amazing, amazing invader. And uh, he was able to almost conquer the entire then known world, but Alexander actually died young. And they say he died in a drunken stupor. Now, Greece is going to rule uh, Palestine from 331 to 164 BC. Now, under Alexander II, there was freedom given for the Jewish people uh, to operate uh, fairly independently. Uh, Greece didn't impose uh, too much on them. But then Alexander dies and four of his generals uh, are given uh, the rule of the, literally the world. <laughs> and these four fellows fight among themselves, as always happens, you know. You have a dynamic leader and uh, if you don't have a good replacement, uh, then all hell breaks lo loose after that leader's death. But 
Here is the name that I want you to uh, latch on to. I mean, I could have gone into extreme details on this. Some of you would have fallen asleep, so I didn't want to go that direction. But this name, you have to put it on the sticky side of your brain. Because what this guy did is what Antichrist is going to do when he comes on the world scene sooner than later. And the name is Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, what did this ruler do? This Greek ruler, he came and uh, look at it in your notes. Jerusalem was plundered. The walls that Nehemiah built were all torn down. The temple was desecrated. Temple sacrifices were abolished. The Holy of Holies was stripped of his costly furniture. And the Jewish religion was banned. And now here is the ultimate abomination. A pig was sacrificed on the altar. And the temple at Jerusalem was rededicated to Jupiter uh, Olympius. And a statue erected in his honor on the altar. And the people were subjected to monstrous uh, cruelties. <clears throat> what I have listed is just a partial list of what Antiochus Epiphanes did. Now, what did the Greeks bring, into, uh, bring to the table? Now, you've got to listen very carefully because there were some good things that the Greeks brought to the table. <clears throat> the Greeks brought philosophy. So today, if you follow any course on philosophy, uh, you are going to learn about the Greek uh, philosophers. And a multi-god worshipping culture, so that instead of the one true living god, there are now a pantheon of gods <clears throat> introduced to the people. The Greeks also brought magic. <clears throat> they brought the uh, onslaught of mystery religions that were associated with the occult. And they brought the Greek language. That's the one I want you to think through. They made the Greek language virtually the official language of the whole world. So you're, you're a Hebrew and uh, you, you know Aramaic and the Hebrew. But uh, now you were forced to learn Greek and so you became bilingual. Not only did you know Hebrew, Aramaic, but now you know Greek. And what's important about that is that uh, eventually the Bible got translated, the Old Testament got translated into the Greek language, and that is how the word of God spread in the early days of church history. And we'll come to that also uh, quite shortly. <clears throat> so number two is Greece, and the two big names there are Alexander the Great and Antiochus Epiphanes. Now the third leader that we are going to look at is Judas Maccabeus. Judas Maccabeus is a revered name even today among the Jewish people. And that's referred to as the Maccabean period. So let me read the paragraph. The excessiveness by Antiochus provoked the Jews to revolt and resist. My goodness, how could you be a Jew and sit still doing nothing when your temple is plundered, pigs are offered on the altar, the temple is desecrated, how could you sit and just watch as a spectator? So God raised up a man by the name of Judas Maccabeus, and the name means hammer, and he gathered around him an army of what we would today call guerrillas or freedom fighters. And these uh, guerrilla fighters uh, achieved several victories and eventually they were able to recapture Jerusalem. They had the temple refurnished and very significantly on the 25th of December, the anniversary of the temple being polluted three years earlier, the orthodox sacrifices were reinstituted and even today that feast is celebrated in Israel as the feast of dedication. And when the Lord Jesus Christ was here on earth, he actually attended the temple 
uh, to celebrate the Feast of Dedication. <clears throat> now, after Judas Maccabeus was killed, his brother Simon took over and he was successful in freeing Judah of all foreign troops. <clears throat> so it means that Judah once again had become an independent nation. No foreign soldiers on its territory. Now two things happen because of Judas Maccabeus, Simon and the Maccabean revolt. The first thing is that the <clears throat> Jewish priests fanned out across the land among the people and they started teaching the people the oneness of God. Remember, the whole nation had been polluted with the philosophy of many gods, right? right? Pantheon of gods. And now the doctrine of the oneness of God is reintroduced back into the life and culture of the Jewish people. So this is what is called the famous Jewish Shema, which uh, is mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, <clears throat> the Lord your God is one God. And even today, if you go to Israel, uh, this is what you would hear at the beginning of any Sabbath day. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. So not only the oneness of God was being proclaimed, but now here is where Christmas is going to start taking shape. The messianic hope was being proclaimed. The coming of a Messiah, which had been prophesied uh, throughout the Old Testament. Now the priests are faithful in teaching the people to look for the Messiah. So two very important, interesting truths that were being taught to the people uh, under the Maccabean revolt. Now the fourth leader that we have to consider for a moment has got to be Rome. So Rome <laughs> conquers the world and they conquer Judah and uh, Judah loses its independence. Now there are five things that Rome did, without going into too much of detail, that prepared the way for the coming of the Messiah. So here we go. <clears throat> Number one, Rome brings law. Rome, Rome was well known for law and justice, and so Rome brought in law. Sometimes it was very harshly executed, but nevertheless, people are now coming under law. Secondly, they bring a peace called the famous Pax Romana. All over the world, there is now peace. Rome has succeeded in uh, uh, quelching all revolt, and there is a peace which made it easy for travel and which made it easy for the proclamation of the gospel in the then known world. You know, it's very difficult to travel when there is war taking place. Number three, Rome brought a stable government. So you didn't have to worry about governments being toppled and there being insecurity. There was a very stable government running the whole world at that particular time. Number four, sadly and tragically, Rome brought in slavery. Slavery. It is estimated that in the Roman Empire, five out of every seven people were slaves. So at the time of the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth, slavery was a very dominant issue. And uh, on Tuesdays we are reading through 1 Timothy, and Paul gives Timothy a lot of instructions as to how Christian slaves should behave, right? They should not resist, they should not revolt, they should submit, and they should... Uh, by their life, be able to win over their, uh, their bosses, their masters. Very interesting teaching. And uh, then another good thing that Rome did, number five, Rome built roads. So Rome was well known for the building of highways, super highways. Now again, keep it in mind. One common language, which is the... Greek language and peace all over the world 
and then a very good road system where you can travel. Ideal conditions for the coming of the Messiah, for the birth of the church, and for missionary journeys, and for the proclamation of the gospel in the then known world. So that's why the 400 years are not technically silent period. God was actively at work, setting the stage for the coming of the Messiah. So now, point B in your notes, we looked at the rulers, but we also need to take a look at the readings that were available during this 400 year period. Okay, uh, what were the literature that was available uh, during the 400 year period? Four of them. Number one is the Apocrypha, which is a, a collection of about 15 books, very historical in nature. Now, those of you who come uh, from a Roman Catholic background, in the Roman Catholic Bible, you have the Apocrypha. So now, the question is often asked me, uh, so what do we do with the Apocrypha? <laughs> Very simple response, folks, read it. If you read it, you'll uh, learn a lot of history about the 400 year silent period. So, so don't, don't, don't take a negative approach towards the Apocrypha. Uh, you can read it and enjoy history. <clears throat> Secondly, I hope I'm pronouncing this uh, right, Sudipigrapha. <laughs> How do you like that for a collection of books? They were sectarian, uh, sectarian writings and they focused on the values and the mindset of the people during that time period. And there were 60 such books. If you want to know the values, the culture, and the thinking of the people during that 400 year time period, these are the 60 books that you would read during the summertime. Without going on holidays anywhere, you will sit under a tree and read these 60 books. Number three, and this is a big one, you need to put a star by the side of it, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there were a group of Jewish people called the Essenes, and the Essenes uh, liked to withdraw from society. Uh, the Essenes didn't like uh, social life. Uh, they didn't like to live in town. So they went and lived in the desert, and their main objective was to preserve the integrity of the scriptures. And we are indebted to the Essenes because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were discovered in 1948, and they authenticate a good part of the Old Testament, including the entire book of Isaiah. And those were the works of the Essenes. So those uh, writings were available during this 400 year period. And then put a star by the side of number four. The Septuagint, often abbreviated by the Roman numerical 70. Now here's an interesting uh, uh, it's not actually a fact, but uh, it, it sounds uh, too good to let, let it go. A belief that 70 scholars produced the Old Testament in 70 days. <laughs> uh, it's uh, mission impossible. But uh, that's the kind of rumor that went around. But definitely 70 scholars were set apart to take the Old Testament scriptures and to translate it from Hebrew, Aramaic into the Greek language. So guess what was used extensively during the time of the Lord Jesus Christ? It was the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures. And so those are the four main readings or literature that were available during the 400 year silent period. Now I'm a bookworm, I love books, I love literature, I love to read, man, I would have just sat under some tree, fig tree, and I would have just read all this stuff, right? While you played golf, I would have read this, right? Okay, okay, you, you have to talk back, otherwise I'm, I'm wondering whether I've lost you. You're with me? Okay, you're alive? Okay, uh, you're enjoying this history lesson? Very much so? Okay, because at the end, uh, during the mealtime, I'll come and ask you some questions, right? Some of you are pretending to listen, but your thoughts are on the meal, I know that. 
<laughs> okay, now, point C, the religion that prevailed during this 400 year period. Rulers, readings, and now we come to the religion. And I want to introduce you to nine categories of people and what they had to bring to the table. Very, very interesting. You know, your whole understanding of the New Testament will come alive if you understand this. Number one, the temple. The temple was there. My goodness, that's the center, the showpiece of worship. Every Jewish male, it was mandatory that at least three times during the year, you had to come to the temple to observe and celebrate three main feasts, right? Doesn't matter where you lived, you have to make that pilgrimage to Jerusalem uh, to observe those feasts. So you have the temple with all its ritual and sacrifices. Secondly, the synagogues. Now in the gospels, very, uh, very often you read the Lord Jesus went to the synagogue. In the book of Acts, you read Paul went to the synagogue. So what is a synagogue? Synagogue is like a school, uh, like what we today would call Sunday school. It was a school, a place of instruction. I want you to write that down by the side of synagogue so that you will understand it better. A place of instruction. So this is where you would come and sit and uh, somebody would read from the Old Testament scrolls and then somebody else will be asked to get up and give a word of exhortation, to give an explanation. And that's what the Lord Jesus did in Luke chapter 4, when he went to uh, his hometown and he went to the synagogue. Uh, the scriptures were read and uh, the Lord Jesus Christ uh, said, I am the fulfillment of what we just read now. And man, that crowd turned on him and nearly pushed him off uh, the top of a cliff because they just couldn't handle what he said. So, the synagogues. Number three are the scribes. Now, the best way to understand the scribes, I've inserted the word for you, they are the lawyers. I mean, these are not dumb guys. These were brilliant guys who spent years and years and years studying law, Old Testament scriptures in minute detail and uh, they, they are very often found in the gospel narratives and they are the ones who give interpretation and application of the scriptures to the people. So from today's point of view, they were technically the preachers, the pastor boys. So you can call me scribe. If you're sick and tired of this word pastor, right? You can call me scribe and I won't get offended. You're actually calling me a lawyer. Okay, Rebecca? I'll be honored. Right. You're happy? Okay. So, uh, so, so, so they would explain the scriptures and apply the scriptures to the people. The fourth group, I think the one that you are the most familiar uh, with but <laughs> have no understanding who they are, are the Pharisees. You know, from time to time we look at somebody and say, don't be a Pharisee. By the way, here's the bad news. All of us have a Pharisee spirit in us. All of us, no exceptions. Right? So who is a Pharisee? They were the separatists. You know, they, they were very concerned about uh, moral ceremonial purity. So uh, these are like, uh, I don't know whether this is a good illustration, but uh, these are like the religious police in Saudi Arabia. Okay? These are the guys who will go around to make sure that you are sticking to the details of the law. So the Pharisees, for the most part, were a hated group. You don't like a religious uh, police coming and asking you to do certain things which uh, you enjoy doing. So it, when you uh, come across the word Pharisee, just think of the word separatist, right? They wanted the people to be separated to Jehovah, to be separated from the world system, 
and to belong to God exclusively. Not a bad, not a bad uh, goal. Uh, in that sense, I am a Pharisee. I am a separatist. I am sold out to God. I want to live a life separated to God. I want to, as much as possible, be separated from the world. From that point of view, the Pharisees were good. But now here is where they went wrong. They started to add to the scriptures. So for every scripture that you read, they would give you laws and bylaws. And my goodness, they made uh, religion a terrible headache for the people. <laughs> Just take the Sabbath day alone. For the Sabbath day alone, right, Friday evening 6 p.m. to Saturday evening 6 p.m., you had to observe hundreds of bylaws, which included how uh, long you could travel, which included what you could cook, what you could carry, what you could wear. So just imagine if you were the average uh, Jewish person, my goodness, you had all these laws on one hand and you had to meticulously observe them, otherwise the separatists were at your door and you are in trouble. So the Pharisee is the ritualist. He is always adding to scripture. And you have that group today. People don't like to go by the Bible alone. Oh, I want to go by this book also, by this book also, by this book also. The less you quote other books, the better. Right? I always look for preachers who are just sold out on the word of God, the Bible. And that's what I seek to do every Sunday. Just give you the Bible, the pure word of God. Once in a way I quote somebody, but uh, that's just like a rabbit trail, right? The main course has got to be the word of God. Now, the next group are the Sadducees, and they ultimately were responsible for the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. So who are these guys? These are the wealthy guys in society. They were very influential priestly families, and uh, they had very good connections with Roman authorities, uh, but uh, they uh, completely denied the supernatural. They didn't believe in the bodily resurrection. They didn't believe in angels or spirits. So that is why they were sad, you see. That's not original with me. Some of you didn't get it. That's okay. Next Christmas you'll get it. Uh, that's why they were sad, you see, because they didn't believe in the supernatural, right? So they are the rationalists of today, and they are taking away from Scripture, right? They are undermining Scripture, taking away from Scripture. One of my favorite questions to you, and I hope the question that you will also throw back at me has got to be the question, what does it say in the Bible? For whatever you're saying, where is the biblical evidence? And if there is no biblical evidence, then you had better be silent. I had better be silent, right? For everything, there has got to be a biblical mandate. We go by the book, the word of God. Otherwise, you end up being a Sadducee, okay? Just taking away from scripture. And then you start quoting people and other books. Now, number six are the Herodians, and they were a political group, as the name suggests. These were uh, Jewish people who uh, loved to canvas Herod the governor, the Roman governor, right? And uh, they were the secularists, <laughs> and you know how uh, you can identify a Herodian? They were totally indifferent to the scriptures. They didn't care about God, they didn't care about the Bible, totally indifferent to scripture and how many people like that you meet in life, right? Totally indifferent to the scriptures. Won't even want to take a Bible and read. Hey, just read it. No, I don't want to read. Totally indifferent. Then number seven, you have another interesting group called the Zealots. These were Jewish people, uh, usually young people, uh, red hot blood, and they just wanted to wipe out every Roman they saw. <laughs> they wanted their land free to be independent. So these are the guerrilla fighters. These are the freedom fighters. 
very interesting when the Lord Jesus chose his 12 disciples, one of them was a zealot. And I could just picture the zealot, Simon the zealot, with Matthew the tax collector. Man, Simon would have waited for the opportunity to take, Matthew said. Because Matthew was helping the Roman government. Somebody should have told the Lord Jesus, that's a bad match. But that's what God does in the church. He takes unlovely people and puts them together. I thought you would have said a loud amen. God never takes lovable people and put them together. <laughs> he takes people at the opposite ends of the spectrum and puts them together. Some of you are saying my marriage is like that. Right? Better keep it quiet. Better not laugh. Right? Uh, but uh, God is a specialist in taking people people who are radical and subjugating them and putting them to constructive use in his kingdom. Amazing. Uh, sometime I must do a series on the 12 disciples. You'll be blown away. Then, of course, another group you have to look at is uh, number eight, the Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin, technically speaking, is the Jewish Supreme Court made up of priests and the high priests and there were 71 members. It's very interesting when the Lord Jesus chose his initial disciples, he chose 70. Very interesting when you compare it. Almost like saying, this 70 is going to be the authority. Okay, uh, something to chew about. Now, of course, we mustn't miss out on number nine, the common people. So the common people are living among all these groups of people. And uh, what can you say about the common people? They were reeling under heavy Roman taxation. If you think you and I are paying a lot of taxes, you haven't read uh, the 400-year silent period. Right? The amount of taxes the Jewish people were paying. And uh, they were looking for deliverance from Roman oppression, right? The iron yoke of Rome. Who is going to come and who is going to set us free? All this to say this, the stage is set for the coming of the Messiah. Now, do you appreciate the 400-year silent period? And as I was thinking through this and as, as I was thinking about uh, partaking at the Lord's table, one Carol just jumped into my mind. And it has got to be, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Uh, I think a slide is going to come up now. And I want you to focus on the words. We'll sing it later. But I want you to focus on the words now as we prepare to partake at the Lord's table. So as it comes up on the screen, I'm going to read to you the first two stanzas. Look at the words. It's almost like put yourself as living in the 400-year silent period, the dark period. And now look at the words. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. They were under Roman yoke. That mourns in lowly, lonely exile here. They are in mourning. They are in profound grief the Jewish people, right? Uh, they, are, they feel exiled. Until the Son of God appear. Whom are they waiting for? The appearance of the Son of God, the Messiah. And then it breaks out into this jubilant praise. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. Your longing, longing is going to be fulfilled. Emmanuel is going to come and meet you at your point of need. You know, that's why, folks, when we sing these carols, you can't sing it without any emotion. You know, dead like this, look at the other person, you look at that person. You can't. These words are so potent that they should just revert you to just jumping and shouting because that is our expectation too, right? Now look at stanza two. O come, thou rod of Jesse. That's another name for the Lord Jesus Christ. From a dead stump, a branch is going to shoot out, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. 
free thine own from Satan's tyranny. How interestingly the songwriter switched gears. No, no, it's not just the, the, the oppression from Rome, but far worse, the oppression under Satan. We are captives of Satan. We are living under Satan's tyranny. O oh, Messiah, come to deliver us, to set us free. From depths of hell thy people save. So the writer didn't fight shy of using, uh, teaching the doctrine of hell. We are all on our way to hell. But O oh, Messiah, come and deliver us from the hell that we deserve. And give them victory over the grave. What is one of your number one fears? Yesterday I was speaking to a, at a carol service and this is one of my uh, high points. I said we all in our lonely moments have the fear of death. We might speak very bravely in a crowd. But hey, when you are by yourself and thinking it through, there is that fear of death, right? And the Messiah is going to come so that he is going to conquer the grave. And because he lives, I shall live also. Right. Very weak, amen, but uh, uh, still I'll take it. Man, that should have caused the roof to fly open. Right. If you, if you, if you came from the uh, Salvation Army tradition, you should have blown the trumpet. Wow. Then uh, again, the, the refrain. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. You can put your name there. I can put my name there. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, Benjamin. You must learn to personalize the songs, right? And then uh, the third stanza and fourth stanza, again, look at a couple of uh, lines I picked up. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night and death's dark shadows put to flight. We are living in a time of darkness, moral darkness, isn't it? Oh, Messiah, Emmanuel, come and put these shadows to flight. May there be perpetual light all around us. And then the final lines, open wide, our heavenly home, open the gates of heaven, let us in. Make safe the way that uh, leads on high and close the path of misery. Shut the door to misery and open wide the door to heaven, to joy, to angels, to the Lord Jesus. Wow! I couldn't go to sleep after I studied this song. I struggled to get to bed yesterday. I went to bed into, into the wee hours of the morning because I was so excited at this carol that came alive to me because I studied uh, the 400 years of silence. So on that note, we are going to partake of the Lord's table. And I want you to think through the words that we rehearse together. And I want you to do your own prayer. I hope you came with preparation. Right? I hope you came with preparation that you are going to swing wide the door of your heart to let Emmanuel in so that he can do for us everything that this song has spoken about. So I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And uh, if you don't have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, please don't partake at the table because the Bible explicitly says it will not be a table of blessing. It will be a table of condemnation. But if you have repented of your sins, if you have embraced the Lord Jesus Christ to be your one and only Savior, and if you can very honestly say the Lord is making everything new in my life, I am a transformed uh, person by the grace of God, then you can partake of these holy emblems as tokens of appreciation for what Emmanuel did 2,000 years ago on the cross for us. So uh, we are going to pray together. Now, uh, I am uh, assuming, uh, JK, we are going to pass it around. Uh, uh, what do we have in our, okay. Uh, we are going to come to the front, so uh, Sunny will have to remove the, this thing. So, uh, let's pray. Lord, those were supposedly 400 years of silence, but behind the scenes, Lord, you were actively at work. You were preparing a people for the coming of the Messiah. 
And as these uh, words of this carol just, just Lord, uh, came to life for me, uh, to know that you came to uh, put to flight the dark shadows of night, to close the door on misery, and to release me from the power of uh, Satan, and to uh, give me assurance of my heavenly home. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming, for dying, for rising again. And thank you for these wonderful gifts that you bless your people with. And as we partake of these holy emblems, may we do so with uh, fear and trembling and also with great joy because Emmanuel has come and so we want to rejoice. And so take these words and apply it to each one of our hearts. Forgive us our many sins and may we partake in a holy manner, right with you and right with our fellow brother and sister, and that we can partake in order to say thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord Jesus, for all what you have done for us. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen. So we want to invite you to come to the